In 2018, China dumped 800 million oyster shells into water so toxic that fish dissolved within hours. Scientists called it biological suicide. Critics called it the most expensive garbage dump in history. The price tag? $2.3 billion to bury literal restaurant waste into toxic sludge. But five years later, something impossible happened. This dead zone now produces more seafood than Japan, South Korea, and Vietnam combined. Keep watching, because you're about to discover how China accidentally cracked nature's code and transformed an underwater graveyard into Asia's richest fishing ground. Did you know that over 40% of China's coastal waters were classified as biologically dead by 2018? We're not talking about polluted water with fewer fish. We're talking about underwater deserts where nothing survives. Industrial runoff, agricultural waste, and untreated sewage had created zones so toxic that marine life simply couldn't exist. The numbers are staggering. Traditional fishing grounds that once fed hundreds of millions had collapsed. Catch rates dropped 70% in just 20 years. Imagine being a fisherman watching your nets come up emptier year after year, generation after generation. 23 million jobs hung in the balance. Entire coastal communities faced extinction, not from war or famine, but from water that had turned into poison. But here's what made this crisis truly terrifying. 1.4 billion people depend on seafood as their primary source of protein. China was spending $15 billion annually just to import fish from other countries. Factory fish farms that were supposed to solve the problem only made things worse, spreading disease and contaminating the supply chain with antibiotics. The nation that invented aquaculture thousands of years ago couldn't feed itself from its own waters. The situation grew even more desperate after 2011. The Bohai Sea oil spill, the worst in Chinese history, killed 90% of marine life in affected areas. Chinese fishing vessels started venturing into contested waters near the Philippines, Indonesia and Vietnam, sparking international incidents that threatened regional stability. Then came the 2017 seafood panic. Contamination scandals caused public trust to collapse overnight. Domestic fish prices crashed 40%. Families stopped buying local seafood entirely, convinced it would make them sick. The government faced a simple reality. Restore coastal productivity or watch social instability sweep through fishing communities. This wasn't just an environmental problem anymore. It was a matter of national security. China's obsession with food independence runs deep, rooted in the trauma of the Great Famine between 1959 and 1961. They would not let history repeat itself. Before the oyster shell breakthrough, China tried everything Western experts recommended, and everything failed spectacularly. From 2008 to 2015, they launched massive artificial reef programs. They sunk old ships, concrete blocks, even decommissioned subway cars into dead zones, hoping marine life would return. The theory made sense. Give fish places to hide and breed, and populations will recover. The result? Those structures corroded and became toxic metal leaching sites adding heavy metals to already poisoned waters. 78% showed zero marine recovery. They had turned one problem into two. Next came the chemical treatment plants. From 2012 to 2016, China built over 200 water treatment facilities along the coastline at a cost of $8 billion. These massive facilities were supposed to clean industrial discharge before it reached the ocean. But here's the harsh truth. Those plants only treated 30% of actual discharge. Factories simply dumped their waste at night when inspectors weren't watching. Bribes flowed faster than clean water. $8 billion with minimal measurable impact. The most heartbreaking attempt was the fish restocking program. Between 2010 and 2018, China released 50 billion juvenile fish into coastal waters. 50 billion. That's more fish than there are stars visible to the naked eye from Earth. Scientists carefully bred these fish in hatcheries, transported them to release sites, and watched them swim away into what they hoped would be recovery. The survival rate? Less than 2%. You can't rebuild a food chain by adding animals at the top when there's nothing for them to eat. Scientists started calling it feeding the dead zone. You can't rebuild life in water that kills everything it touches. Even seaweed farming initiatives failed. The algae died faster than it could be planted. The water was too acidic, oxygen levels too low. Every solution designed in laboratories and boardrooms crumbled against the reality of China's devastated coastline. The verdict was clear. Every Western recommended solution failed catastrophically in Chinese conditions. Then came Project Ocean Phoenix, and it started with what seemed like the craziest idea imaginable, burying garbage. The location they chose was the Bohai Yellow Sea Transition Zone. 
12,000 square kilometers of the most polluted coastal water in all of Asia. To put that in perspective, that's larger than the entire country of Jamaica. Scientists had written it off as unsavable. It sat between Beijing, Tianjin, and Korea, right in the busiest shipping lanes on the continent. Over 400 vessels transited through daily. Pollution poured in from every direction. Multiple experts publicly stated that restoration was impossible. But that's exactly why Chinese researchers chose it. If restoration could work here, in the absolute worst conditions imaginable, it could work anywhere on Earth. The vision was audacious. Transform this dead water into the world's largest natural oyster reef ecosystem. Not just restore it to what it was before, but create productivity levels exceeding pre-industrial conditions. The timeline was aggressive. Five-year experimental phase, 15-year full deployment, the project was classified as National Strategic Infrastructure, given the same priority level as the Three Gorges Dam. The Chinese Academy of Fishery Sciences partnered with the Ministry of Natural Resources to lead what some were already calling the most ambitious ecological experiment in human history. Here's where it gets fascinating. The key insight came from studying how oyster reefs naturally form. Oyster larvae need something hard to attach to. In healthy oceans, they attach to the shells of dead oysters, building layer upon layer over centuries. But in dead zones, there's nothing for them to grab onto. No foundation means no reef. No reef means no ecosystem. No ecosystem means no fish. The entire food chain depends on that first attachment. So Chinese scientists asked a simple question. What if we gave them 800 million shells to start? With. The engineering behind Project Ocean Phoenix unfolded in three precise phases, each building on the last. Phase one began in 2019 with the shell burial. Collection teams gathered 800 million oyster shells from restaurants, processing plants, and aquaculture waste across eight provinces. 15,000 collection points funneled shells to 340 processing facilities. This alone created 45,000 temporary jobs in rural areas where unemployment had been rising for years. But these shells weren't just dumped into the ocean. Each shell was crushed into fragments between 2 and 8 centimeters, the optimal size for oyster larvae to attach. Researchers had tested dozens of fragment sizes and found this range provided the perfect surface area and stability. The fragments were mixed with calciumite powder and 800 specialized bacteria strains designed to jumpstart biological activity. These bacteria would begin breaking down pollutants and creating microenvironments where oyster larvae could thrive. 340 specially modified barges deployed four 4.2 million metric tons of prepared shell material across 8,000 hectares. To put that in perspective, that's enough material to fill over 40,000 Olympic swimming pools. The logistics cost $340 million. Barges worked around the clock for 18 months, carefully depositing layers of treated shells across the seafloor. Phase 2 launched in 2020 with the seeding. Researchers released 12 billion laboratory-bred oyster larvae in calculated waves. But here's what made this different from failed restocking programs. Programs. Timing was everything. Scientists synchronized releases with lunar cycles and precise temperature windows. They had studied natural oyster reproduction for years, mapping exactly when larvae were most likely to survive. They weren't just throwing larvae into the water and hoping. They were orchestrating a biological symphony. The target survival rate was 8%, four times the natural rate. And because the larvae now had millions of tons of shell fragments to attach to, combined with beneficial bacteria already colonizing those surfaces, they had a fighting chance. Early monitoring showed attachment rates exceeding projections within the first three months. Phase three began in 2021, and this is where nature started doing the heavy lifting. This was the cascade effect. A single adult oyster filters 190 liters of water every single day. That's roughly 50 gallons, enough to fill a bathtub. At full maturity, the restored reef would filter 2 trillion liters daily. That's enough to process the entire volume of the restoration zone multiple times per month. The water would essentially clean itself. But filtration was just the beginning. As oysters grew, their shells created three-dimensional structures. Crevices and caves formed naturally. Small fish moved in, finding shelter from predators. Those fish attracted larger predators. Crabs, shrimp, and mollusks colonized the spaces between shells. Within three years, over 300 secondary species had returned to waters that five years earlier couldn't support a single living creature. The reef had become a city, with each species filling a role in an increasingly 
highly complex society. Supporting this biological transformation was the most sophisticated ocean monitoring network ever built. 2,400 underwater sensors tracked oxygen levels, pH, temperature, and biomass in real time across the entire restoration zone. These weren't simple thermometers. They were Internet of Things devices constantly streaming data to centralized servers. An artificial intelligence system analyzed patterns, predicting potential die-off events 72 hours in advance. When sensors detected trouble, like a sudden drop in oxygen or a temperature spike, emergency response teams could intervene before problems cascaded through the ecosystem. 14 manned research stations, essentially floating laboratories, provided constant human oversight. Scientists lived aboard these platforms for weeks at a time, conducting experiments and taking samples that automated systems couldn't capture. The Chinese Space Agency partnered on satellite monitoring, tracking water clarity and algae levels from orbit, providing a bird's-eye view that complemented the underwater sensors. The data infrastructure alone cost $280 million. To protect the fragile recovering ecosystem, engineers installed 180 kilometers of underwater pollution curtains, essentially massive filters blocking industrial runoff from entering the restoration zone. Think of it as building a wall around an entire city, except underwater and invisible. 34 emergency response ships stayed stationed permanently nearby, ready to deploy at any sign of trouble. Another $420 million invested in defense. Six mega hatcheries now produce 20 billion oyster larvae annually ensuring the reef can continuously regenerate and expand. These aren't ordinary oysters either. A genetic selection program bred pollution, resistant strains capable of surviving conditions that would kill wild populations. Temperature-controlled nurseries covering 200 hectares keep the supply chain flowing regardless of seasonal variations. The total supporting infrastructure investment reached $1.6 billion. Combined with the core restoration work, Project Ocean Phoenix represents a $2.3 billion bet on biological engineering. Some leaked documents suggest the actual figure may be closer to $4.7 billion when all costs are counted. Now here's where this story becomes truly remarkable, because it worked. By 2024, shell deployment reached 100% completion across the target zone. Official oyster survival rates hit 67%, far exceeding the 8% target. Even conservative independent estimates place survival between 45 and 55%, still dramatically beating expectations. But the real measure wasn't oyster survival. It was what happened to everything else. Fish populations increased 12 times compared to 2019 levels. 12 times. Waters that couldn't support life now teemed with it. Species that hadn't been seen in decades returned. Local fishermen reported catching varieties their grandfathers talked about, but they had never personally seen. Marine biologists documented species they had assumed were locally extinct. Water clarity transformed from 0.3 meters visibility to 4.2 meters. That's a 14-fold improvement. Divers who entered the water in 2019 described it as swimming through soup. By 2023, they could see clearly in every direction. Oxygen levels rose 340%. The water itself had come back to life. And then the larger animals returned. Dolphins appeared in monitoring footage for the first time in over a decade. Sharks, once completely absent from these waters, started patrolling the reef edges. Sea turtles, which had abandoned the region entirely, began showing up in increasing numbers. The entire ecosystem was rebuilding itself, layer by layer. Zhang Liu is a local fisherman whose family had fished these waters for four generations. His grandfather told stories of abundant catches, but Zhang Liu had only known decline. When asked about the project's complicated politics and funding disputes, he shrugged. The fish returned, he said. I don't care about the politics. The fish returned. My children will be fishermen. That was not true five years ago. The economic transformation matched the ecological one. Annual seafood production is projected to reach 2.8 million metric tons by 2030, valued at $12 billion annually. That would exceed the total project investment within five years of reaching full capacity. Premium reef-grown oysters now command 300% price premiums in Japanese and Korean markets. Buyers specifically seek out oysters from the restoration zone, recognizing their superior quality. The same waters that produced nothing now produce some of the most valuable seafood in Asia. 180,000 direct fishing and aquaculture jobs have been created. 400,000 indirect jobs in processing, transport, and restaurants support the expanding industry. 2,300 coastal villages that faced abandonment now have futures again. Seafood prices have dropped 25% domestically, making protein more accessible for inland populations who previously couldn't afford it. 
Tourism is exploding. Underwater viewing tunnels are planned for 2028. Eco diving permits already generate $200 million annually, and the program hasn't even reached full scale. Coastal property values in adjacent areas have increased 40%. Beyond food production, the restored reef system is capturing carbon at remarkable rates. Oyster shells are essentially calcium carbonate, locking away carbon dioxide as they grow. The reef now sequesters 2.1 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. Blue carbon credits from this sequestration could potentially be worth $800 million. China is positioning the project not just as food security infrastructure, but as climate infrastructure, a model for how coastal restoration can address multiple crises simultaneously. The world is watching and learning. Indonesia sent delegations to study the methods and is planning a $400 million similar project for its own degraded coastlines. The Philippines signed a technology sharing agreement despite ongoing territorial tensions with China, recognizing that ecological restoration transcends political disputes. Saudi Arabia is investing $1.2 billion in Chinese consultation for Red Sea restoration, hoping to revive their own damaged marine environments. Kenya launches a pilot program in 2025 with Chinese funding and expertise. The European Union is considering adopting Chinese methodology for Mediterranean dead zones that have plagued Southern Europe for decades. The World Bank is studying the project as a potential model for climate adaptation funding worldwide. If this works at scale, it changes everything we thought we knew about what's possible. If this model proves sustainable long-term, China will have established itself as the global leader in ocean restoration technology. The strategic implications are enormous. Whoever masters this capability controls food security for three billion coastal residents worldwide. Challenges remain, of course. South Korea filed a United Nations complaint over what they call unilateral ecosystem manipulation in shared waters. Japan expressed concerns about genetic contamination of wild oyster stocks from the laboratory bred strains. Vietnam worries about downstream effects on Mekong Delta fisheries. These concerns deserve serious attention. The ecosystem depends heavily on a single oyster species. 80% reliance on one variety means one disease outbreak could theoretically collapse the entire system. Japanese sea stars and Pacific crabs have been detected in restoration zones raising concerns about invasive species disrupting the delicate balance. Phase 3. Expansion has been delayed 18 months due to funding disputes. The 2023 typhoon season destroyed 15% of established reef structures, demonstrating how vulnerable the system remains to extreme weather. Between 2025 and 2030, the project will face its ultimate test. Either the ecosystem stabilizes permanently and becomes truly self-sustaining, or it requires perpetual intervention at costs of $400 million, annually with no exit strategy. What China accomplished in the Bohai Yellow Sea Transition Zone challenges everything we thought we knew about ecological restoration. They took water so dead that fish dissolved within hours and transformed it into the most productive fishing ground in Asia. They buried 800 million shells that critics called garbage and grew an ecosystem that now feeds millions and captures carbon and creates hundreds of thousands of jobs. Is this humanity's blueprint for healing the oceans? A model that could save coastal communities from Indonesia to California, from Kenya to the Mediterranean? Or is it an engineering marvel that works only under specific conditions with massive ongoing investment? 2030 will tell us the reef is growing, the fish are returning, Dolphins swim where nothing could survive. Families who faced losing everything are building futures again. So what do you think? Has China cracked nature's code or simply delayed the inevitable? Could this technology transform dead zones in your part of the world? Drop your prediction in the comments below. And if this story amazed you, subscribe right now because we go deep on impossible transformations every single week. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next investigation into how humans are reshaping the planet in ways nobody thought possible.